the page. Uh, now I'm going to throw out the whole message. I'm going to have to look at that. Uh, we're, today we're going to talk about uh, being deceived. And, uh, <laughs> oh, the, 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 the thing, you know, it, it's, it's, it's always an adventure reading the Bible, isn't it? Um, well, you can you can really. Um, I, I guess I really want to start with the question: Do you think you can be fully convinced something is true, but be wrong in your mind? You fully believe something is true with your whole mind, okay? Along with that same question: If you believe something with your whole heart, does that make it true? No. But if you ask our culture, that's exactly what that means. Where our culture says that if you feel something. That is, that's just the standard. You know, that's just how it is. Um, we're getting ready to talk about Satanism here in a few weeks with the, the Young Adults group. And uh, much to my surprise, not all Satanists worship the devil. That, that really blew my mind. Um, Satanism is a lot like hedonism, you know? Kind of like whatever, in fact, I think they're, they're, the modern Satanist credo is... Uh, Whatsoever has a go. Do what thou wilt. Do, do what thou wilt. Do whatever you want. You know, and, and Christianity is like the exact opposite of that. You know, like in Christianity, for instance, um, marriage is defined as one man marrying one woman. And that's defined in the Bible as God's view. But in and Satanism it's not like that. It's pretty much any sexual standard that you want. I mean, they don't even draw the line of where this culture does. You know what I mean? Like they would say literally anything sexual that you want is okay. Anything. And it's just, for me, it's like, whoa, that's, it blew my mind because it's complete anarchy, complete opposite of Christianity. No rules, you just do whatever you want. And I really, I guess the view of life is to have as much fun as possible before you die, I guess. Um, hard to find a resounding theme in Satanism, but that seems to be one of them. And uh, and that's, that's kind of the attitude of our culture, too, you know? Everything's just more about what you feel, what you want to be true, not so much what is true. And if you try talking to somebody about how their view is wrong, oftentimes they'll say, well, that's good for you, but you know, I see things differently. And so it brings up the question, so is there no standard? You know, is there no truth, no absolute standard of right and wrong? Is there no, you know, no morality? And if you read the Bible, it clearly says that yes, there is a standard, which means that even if I'm fully convinced that something is true in my mind, I could be wrong. It also means that just because I feel something doesn't mean that it's, that it's okay, that it's right. You know, um, people in seances, for instance, you know, witchcraft and that kind of stuff, um, they will encounter people who they genuinely, genuinely believe are their dead ancestors, or you know, a friend, or you know, whoever that they've tried to conjure up through the through the seance. You know, and they'll talk and they'll know things that only their only that person would have known. You know, and the whole time they don't even know that they're talking to a demon. Or when demons manifest themselves in such ways that people believe in things like ghosts, which aren't true, <coughs> ghosts don't exist. Or when people believe in haunted houses or something, something to be cursed or you know haunted and that, that kind of an idea. But that's not what the Bible says, which means a demon is just showing you what you want to see. See what I mean? But I saw it with my own eyes. I know it's true. What happens when even what you see can't be trusted? That's a, that's a, that's a hard question to ask. And, and so you have people nowadays who are saying, why should I read this ancient book? I mean, it has no place in my life when I'm seeing things that are true. And so what happens when the things that you see aren't true? That's a hard question to ask, and it's misleading our culture, too. You know, if, if watch watch modern movies and shows. It's all about what you feel, and that's how you define the standard. And so we're going to talk today about being deceived. And you know, it's very easy to be deceived. And here's the thing about being, being deceived: you don't know that you're deceived. If you did, you wouldn't have been deceived, right? <laughs> By definition, right? I mean, <laughs> that makes sense, right? So you can't say, "Oh, I'm not like that," because you don't know if you are, because it's being deceived. That's a hard thing to grasp. I, I always had in my head, like, I know if I was being deceived. Even when we're talking with people in the cult or, or cultists, we always have, like, this shred of somewhere in this room. They know that what they're doing is wrong. Do they? See what I mean? Like, if they're deceived, then by nature they actually don't know. 
that what they're doing is wrong. And so I've really been wrestling with this throughout the past couple of weeks, and that's where this this uh, message here came from. Uh, and uh, the last thing I want to say here before I go to the the reasons we get deceived is we all think we would know if we were deceived. And each of us is that there's that bit of, of, of us that says, I would know, I'm not wrong, everybody else is wrong, and I would know if I was wrong. It's like, uh, uh, you know, when somebody has like a stroke or something and, and they don't, they don't realize that they're having a stroke, you know, and no, I, I think I'd know if I was having a stroke. It's like, buddy, you're having a stroke right now. You, you need to go to the hospital. They're like, I don't think so. You know, it's actually not that uncommon when people have heart attacks or strokes and stuff where they won't quite think clearly. And here's the thing that you know, amuses me. Doctors have released these different things to, to what to look for if you're having a stroke or a heart attack. If you're having a stroke or a heart attack, you might not be in your right mind to remember that list. So why give that? Why, that doesn't make any sense. You want to instead you want to raise awareness for other people so that other people can spot the danger signs because you're probably not going to see them to yourself. And that's the idea of being deceived. You you you, you I, I would know that. You know I would know that. It's like oh, but that's happening right now. And so there's four main reasons that I want to look at today that we get deceived. And I'm not saying this is these are the only reasons we get deceived. I'm just saying these are the four ones I want to look at today. The first one is a persuasive argument. In other words, something sounds good. Okay, you can go to that first slide there, everybody. Um, in other words, something sounds good. Okay, uh, We see this a lot um, on social media. Oh my gosh, you see it so much on social media. Somebody posts something on, on Facebook, for instance, oh, that sounds good. It must be true. It must be true. How many times have you seen the mantra, you know, hey, love is love? Well, is it though? I'm pretty sure that all of us would object to if a child molester said, well, I love that child and that child loved me. We would still think that's wrong, right? But I thought you just said love is love. See what I mean? Like, there's some things in our culture that, that just get repeated over and over again that don't really make sense, but it sounds good. It's a persuasive argument. So we're like, that's true. It's like, well, is it though? So you really have to kind of be on your guard with, with the things, especially things that are on TV all the time and um, the people keep parroting back and forth. It, that doesn't make it true. Um, oh my gosh. I hate how I can never find Colossians. Why? I can find every other book except for Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 says this. You can turn there if you want. Um, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, I was going to read this out of the CSB, but I wanted to get a more literal um, read for today. So this is the NASB. Um, Through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So if you notice, this is, this is a verse that contrasts two different things, according to A or according to B. Now, under according to A, he lists a lot of different things. What are the different things? Uh, philosophy, empty deception, traditions of men elementary principles of the world, but under B, or the anti of what he just said, Christ. So that kind of raises the question, so what is he talking about here? Well, when he says Christ, he's actually kind of talking about a, kind of like a, an, I, I guess you could say a conglomeration, a, a group of ideas. The word of Christ, the Bible, because Christ's words were related with the word, with the Bible, okay? Um, the oral tradition of what Jesus taught when he was still alive. So when he says through Christ, he's not just saying like through this guy that died a couple years ago. He's saying through God, okay? Because Christ is God. Um, so how are some ways that the persuasive, these persuasive arguments get to us, these philosophies and empty deceptions? Well, the first thing that, that came to my mind was sometimes in psychology, right? Because in psychology, they have this idea where people are pretty much born good. And they only make bad decisions, they only do what's wrong because, um, basically, I don't want to get too much into this, basically because of the effect of other people, or of their environment, or different things like that, the condition is to do what's wrong. Which raises a lot of questions, more than it answers questions. A, so you're saying that the first person that ever was, that they corrupted themselves by hanging out with themselves? That doesn't make much sense. <laughs> And then you're saying that this corruption like kept spreading to all these different people. That, that doesn't make sense. Also, B, that doesn't take into account the facts. You can have a toddler who has never watched TV, who has never, you've never done anything bad around him, in complete perfect conditions, and he still does what's wrong. 
how is that possible? If people are just born good and, and it's just it's everything else's fault. See, but yet people believe this because psychologists have said it so often. If you're born good, born good, born good. Even to the point that nowadays in the church world, Christians are believing this exact same thing. We're basically good. You mean by comparison to someone else, you're basically good. You're not Adolf Hitler, in other words. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you meet God's standard. Because here's the thing. There's only one way to meet God's standard, and that's by being God himself. Which means, it doesn't matter how good of a person you are, you need Jesus in your life. Because you're cray-cray without him. Okay? <laughs> what is it that the kids are saying? You're... you're um, okay, what's another idea? Politicians. Oh my gosh. Okay, here's a really here's a really good uh, um, example of persuasive arguments and empty deceit. Um, your politician, whichever one you support, doesn't matter, will convince you that they are God incarnate and that their opponent is Satan. Okay, it doesn't matter who you voted for. I am not even getting into that. I I never preach politics from the stage, but I knew a lot of Trump supporters who said this guy is just going to fix America. He's going to make us great. Awesome. Okay. Then I had heard a lot of Clinton supporters who said this woman is going to just completely revolutionize the world. And don't ever put your trust in a politician. Let me just—I'm not picking sides. I'm just saying you can't put your trust in a politician. It doesn't matter who it is. It could be Ronald Reagan, or it could be Bill Clinton, or it could be George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. It doesn't matter. You never put your trust in a politician. Okay? And honestly, if you believe that the things that they are saying, let me just stop you right there, you're wrong. Because politicians say things, no matter who they are, to get votes. Why? Because as people, we hunger for power. We hunger for it. We, we strive for it. Everything in our life is about conquest, about dominating other things, right? And so politicians have that perfect ability to do that. Okay? And I'm not knocking the fact that we need a government. I'm just saying, don't let yourselves be deceived. And one of the things that politicians will do is us and them, right? Yeah. You're the good guy, they're the bad guy. Your party is going to restore America to greatness, their party is going to completely destroy it. And it's very easy to get caught up into this us and them, to the point where if you're a Republican, you meet a liberal and you're, or a Democrat, whatever you want to say, uh, and you're like, oh, they're the enemy. And it's like, whoa, what happened to sharing Christ? What happened to God's kingdom above man's kingdom? What happened to loving your enemies if they really are your enemy? Yeah. See what I mean? But instead, we've let the politicians define us as having to be against people. See what I mean? So we've been deceived against what Christ's message was without us even realizing. And if you don't think that you are like this, just wait until the next time it's voting season. And then listen to the arguments of the people who support the person that you don't like. You are like this, I promise you, okay? Um, so it's us and them. It's love your country first, but that's not true either, is it? We're supposed to love God's kingdom first. We are foreigners in this world, just like Paul was a foreigner of the Roman Empire. He was a Roman by he was a Roman citizen, but he still claimed that he was a foreigner, even though he was a citizen. Is it good to support your country? That's not what I'm talking about at all. Your support of your country never overcomes your support of God's kingdom. Amen. That's what I'm saying. Not even touching on nationalism. Not my point. Um, another thing, they will destroy your country. You have to watch out for them. What about the news? Well, the news, if you watch the news, only teaches you how to look at the worst situation in every situation. Okay? If you watch Fox, you'll, you'll know that, that the liberals are destroying America. If you watch CNN, oh, those, those, those backwards, hillbilly Republicans. See what I mean? It's always us versus them. Right? That's how the news always portrays it. And they only look at the bad. So then you learn to only look at the bad. But what does Paul say? Whatever things are good, honorable, righteous, think about these things. Don't be thinking about all this nonsense that the world keeps thinking about. What did Jesus say about the end times? He said, all these things are going to happen, but don't let your heart be troubled. These things have to happen. Right? Did Jesus ever say, now, when something happens that makes you uncomfortable, worry and stress about it all night? He never said that. He was always talking about let tomorrow take care of its, itself. Today, trust in God. Okay? That, he was always talking about this kind of stuff. What about philosophies? No one has a right to judge you. Right? Live however you want. It's okay. It's all right. 
you know, do whatever you want, whenever you want. No one has the right to judge you. And it's like, well, I mean, except for a judge, right? Because a judge will judge you about whether you deserve the ticket, right? I mean, right? <laughs> you see what I'm saying, right? So we're saying, we're admitting that there is a standard of some kind because we have a legal system, right? Which then implies that there might be the possibility of, I don't know, a God who's judging us, and didn't Paul say himself to judge those in the church? Not in the sense of judging, um, condemning. We had words about that this morning, right? We had words about not being a condemning person. But Paul, when, when Paul's talking about judging, he's saying about clearing the immorality from among your midst. You know, someone who says that they're a Christian, they're not a Christian, they're just bringing deception, they're, they're bringing false, false teachings, they're bringing confusion, they're, they're tearing apart the church. That's what Paul's talking about, okay? So I don't really want to get confused. Yes, we should not be judgmental people, absolutely. And that's absolutely what the Word was talking about this morning. But uh, anyways, what the world tells us is, hey, you know, you just live and let live. Everybody can, can live in peace together and do their own thing. You know, and, and if you've heard it, coexist. You know, the idea that we can all just be happy by doing our own thing. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem to be working anywhere else. <laughs> I don't see why it would work here. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there, but you know, whatever. Um, another reason why we get deceived, living in sin. Uh, it's really the first thing. So the first, and the same thing, the first thing was persuasive arguments. You can go to the next point there, buddy. The same thing, living in sin. Okay, so 1 Kings chapter 22. It is the last chapter of the book of 1 Kings. And so we've got this king, 1 Kings chapter 22, starting verse 19. We've got this king called Ahab. The most wicked king of the northern northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, now I'm not going to say of all Israel because here's the thing, he wasn't. The most wicked king of all Israel and Judah was a man named Manasseh, and God actually said that his wickedness surpassed the people that lived in Canaan before Israel moved in. So that's kind of a big statement. Ahab was a wicked person. Don't get me wrong, but Manasseh's wickedness way surpassed his. He just, it's like he was looking for every opportunity possible to do what was wrong. I, have you ever seen a, a kid who gets that just destructive look in their eyes and they're just, they're just looking for some way they can disobey? What can I touch? What can I get into? Point me in the right direction. Where? That. You know, and, and once, they, once they see it, they, they have their sight set on it. And surely you guys have seen kids like this, right? And then, then they even think of ways of how they can get around where you won't see. You know, maybe if I just slowly edge... Not touching it. Not touching it. Okay, that's it. You see what I mean? And then, they, hey, mommy, I touched it. You know, and then just any opportunity they can um, to, to do what's wrong. And that, that was Manasseh. But this guy, Ahab, was the most wicked king of the northern kingdom. His name was Ahab. Okay. So in chapter 22, starting in verse um, 19, it says this. Micaiah, who's a prophet who comes to Ahab, Ahab says, should we go to, go to battle? Uh, with this other king, the king of Judah, not really important for, for today. Um, but Micaiah comes and prophesies, and you know, he says about how they're all going to die. And then, then is, uh, Ahab says in, in 18, I told you this guy only says what's bad. He never once tells me what's good. So then in 19, the prophet Micaiah speaks again, and he says, Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. The Lord said, who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? In other words, how will it happen that Ahab can finally die for all of his wickedness? How, 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 how should we do this here? And, and one said this, while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, how? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Because Ahab gathered all these prophets around him who probably believed that they were actually God's prophets. They probably weren't actively thinking, hey, I'm a false prophet. Maybe some of them. But you have to remember, a lot of false prophets are confused themselves. Like Aleister Crowley. I mean, oh my goodness, that guy was confused. Really, really confused. Just terribly confused. Then he said, you are to entice him and also prevail. Go and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets, and the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. In other words, the Lord is enticing you to go to battle so you can die because you've been a very wicked king. So we see the second reason why we're oftentimes um, deceived. When we live in sin, de sin deceives us. Some people think, I can do this, I can dip my feet in the pool, 
and it's going to be fine. But it doesn't work like that, though. Um, it, it just keeps. Have you ever have you ever put um, tar on a roof? It gets everywhere. I don't even know how it gets in the places that it does. You you, you put tar on something, and you're like, okay, I didn't get it on anything. You put it down, you're like, oh, it's there. Okay, let me wash this. Oh, it's on this arm too. You know, it's like a spreading virus. I don't know how it happens, but every time I'm putting tar on a roof, it gets everywhere. Okay, it doesn't matter what your intention was. It's not going to happen like that. That's how sin works. I mean, you think oh, I've got this under control. It's over here. You know, I'm just I'm just doing this. It's not that big of a deal. And then all of a sudden, it's everywhere in your life. You're like, how did this happen? Why am I having such problems with this? Why am I having problems with this attitude and judging this person, doing this? Well, that's why. You know. Um, and that's kind of what happened with Ahab. He lived in sin, and God completely, I mean, just let so many things go that he could have judged Ahab for. But instead, he just let it go and kept bringing by opportunities for Ahab to repent. One of those times, he actually did repent. But then he kept on doing the evil stuff. And he kept going. And so finally, enough is enough, I guess. You know, God had him go out to uh, the battle and he dies. Um, so sin is another another big factor of, of, of why we um, why we get deceived. A third reason, listening to people who tell us what we want to hear. Uh, I think I said no, I said it the same way there. Um, in First John chapter four verse one, it says this. First uh, John is near the end of your Bible. If you've gone to uh, Revelations, you're just a few books too far. First John chapter four verse one says this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. If uh, you guys haven't gotten a chance to, I highly recommend you, you picking up some copies of uh, Pastor's uh, messages from Wednesday nights. He's been talking about false prophets a lot, and actually that was the motivation for this uh, message I want to talk about. You know, it, we really have a lot of false prophets out there. <laughs> really a lot of false prophets. And the thing is, they don't, like Pastor talked about this a couple weeks ago, and I guess the week before his surgery, I guess, they don't look like false prophets. They look like people. Just regular people. And they talk like regular people, you know? It's not going to be somewhere where you walk and you're like, that person's a false prophet. I mean, hypothetically, I guess, the Holy Spirit could impress on your heart. Now be careful, this person's going to be a, oh, a false prophet. Absolutely. But most of the time, you see a false prophet, you're going to be walking down the street, they're going to be walking down the street, and that's it. You know, you're going to see them on TV, you're going to see them on the news, you're going to see them in person, at churches, in, in community functions. They're just going to be people to you, you know? And, and then they're going to say these little things that, that, that sound good when they're not compared to the Bible. So, I mean, if you just take them as what it is, oh, that sounds good. Because that's what false prophets do. They tell you what, what you want to hear. You know, it agrees with what you always already wanted to believe in your spirit. A lot of Satanism seems good to people because it's what you actually wanted to believe anyways. You know what I mean? The whole idea of organized religion, they're all wrong. Well, if, if that was wrong, that, that's great. That means there's no, no concern for, for, for punishment. Hey, that's all right. That sounds good, right? There's no God. Ah, this is getting better all the time. Satan is just is just this force. He's not really a person out there. And you know, you can just do whatever you want and just enjoy your life to your fullest. Carpe diem, right? That sounds good. Except when you compare it to scripture. So I mean like false prophets don't just send in a I'm a false prophet and what I'm saying is not true. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't work like that. They tell us what we secretly want to hear. Okay? Um I know many. Uh, I've known many false prophets. One was actually a pastor of a church, and he was inciting people to divorce. Well, as a pastor, that's not our job, is it? But yet he was going and telling people to get divorced. God hates divorce. That's absolutely right. Why should a pastor have any stake in telling someone to get divorced? See what I mean? I know another pastor. <sighs> With this whole four moons thing, he really, I don't really want to get in too much into it, but with the whole red, remember those red moons that we had a couple weeks ago? He really capitalized on that, and man, he made a killing. Financially, he made a lot of money, because he was offering false hope for something that uh, wasn't even anything, and so he made profit off of people. 
I know another, I know another one uh, who actually is a pastor as well. I know I'm seeing a lot of pastors. Most pastors are good people, okay? But there are wolves among the sheep, so let's just say it like that, okay? Uh, who has, you know, this million-dollar house and doesn't give to the poor because he's the pastor. He just deserves that, respond, that, that respect. And it's like, I, 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 I don't know, that, that feels to me like something that isn't true because I remember Jesus not doing that and climbing off the mountain to talk to people. So I have a little bit of a hard time when a pastor thinks that they're too important to talk to people, too important to serve people. Isn't the whole idea of a pastor a servant? Yes, sir. So I mean, like, there's just some things that, you know, and, and they, they look real good. They, they look exactly like you want them to look, just like a demon will. They probably will present themselves however you want, so you'll believe them. And um, so that's why he says here, listen, uh, test every spirit, okay? So how do you do that? Well, if you read throughout the word, rest of the of First John, he talks about the way that false prophets will contradict what God says. If you talk to a demon, for instance, they'll say Jesus wasn't really God; he was just simply a god. You know, he was a way to heaven. You know, oftentimes they won't just say outright he was not. You know, he he was nothing. They'll oftentimes say something that's just skewed a little bit. Oh yeah, he was Christ, but there's been many Christs. Buddha was a Christ. You know, and they'll just say say things that sound good, but aren't, though. You know? So. Um, and then the, the fourth thing I want to mention, making choices from feelings, desires, passions over God's word, not consulting God on your decision. Um, if, if you look on the screen, uh, Ben, go to the next point there, buddy, or Eli, for respect there. Making choices from feelings over God's words. What you want, what you think is good, rather than saying, now what does the Bible say? You know what I mean? Um, and uh, Amos chapter... In verse 4 The prophet uh, Amos is prophesying over, over Really I guess I guess you just say Three different places Moab which we're not going to look at today Judah and Israel Okay, Judah is the, the southern kingdom Israel is the northern And in verse 2 through 3 he, or I'm sorry Um Four through five, I mess up there. Um, he talks about Judah specifically, and he says, "Thus says the Lord: For three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept His statutes. Their lies also have led them astray. Uh, some translations say their their idols have led them astray. Um, whichever translation you have will have one of those. Um, those after which their fathers walked." So what he's talking about here is the way that they have deceived themselves by doing what they wanted to do rather than what God's word said. Deuteronomy puts it like this. He says, if, if a prophet comes and he says something and it comes true, and then he says, come let us worship other gods, know that the Lord is testing you to see if you'll do what he told you to do or not. In other words, kill the false prophet and move on. Now, we don't kill anymore. That was the thing with Israel back in the day. They're not supposed to kill people anymore either. It was part of the old covenant. We're not under that anymore. Now they're the Jews. Nobody's under the old covenant. That's been put away. So I'm not saying kill people. Okay, <laughs> Don't go out of here and say, Michael told us to kill people. Okay, I did not say that. All right? <laughs> Let me just stop you right there. Okay. Maybe in hindsight I could have said that differently to where it didn't sound like I was inciting violence, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways. Um, not really consulting God with their decision here. They wanted to do something, and so they did it. And, but if you look in verse 4, he says, because they rejected the law of the Lord. Now, how have they rejected the law of the Lord? By not following it. By not listening to it. But most of us have it in our head somewhere. I'm not rejecting God. I just The Bible doesn't apply to me anymore. I just don't understand any of it. How can I possibly get answers to life's questions from that old book? And it's better if I just... If I just mean well in my heart and follow after God, I'm sure I'll just stumble on the right way. And that's not really true, though. I mean, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Uh, you know, it's like shooting a, a 9 millimeter pistol over, over 1,200 yards and hoping to hit the target. Well, I don't know if you ever shot a pistol, but they just don't have that great of accuracy over that far of a distance, especially not a 9 millimeter. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to happen. 1,200 yards is a far, far distance. I mean, it's not out there. 
Uh, and that's kind of what kind of what happens when we don't read the Bible. It's just, ah, it's fine. I'll figure it out. Eh, no, you won't. You won't come. And um, so the fourth reason there, making choices from our feelings, what we want, our passions, over what God's word says. We get tired of something, so we get rid of it. We, uh, you know, we want to do something, so we do it. You know, hey, we'll figure it out when we get there, right? <laughs> Just kind of make a decision and, and then you ask the questions later. And that's not really what God told us to do, though. Proverbs talks over and over again about being wise and discerning, about listening to God, and he will give you the wisdom. Uh, in fact, in the book of James, he specifically says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask me for it, and I will give it. So I, I think that I think that the whole hope to hit your target thing is definitely not <laughs> definitely not what God was going for there. So anyone can be deceived if you go to that last point there, buddy. In Judges chapter 21, 25, um, and this is the only passage I actually want you to turn to today, so please turn to this one, regardless of whether you did the other ones. Judges chapter 21. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not supposed to judge people. Um, uh, this book, chapter 21, <laughs> I'm just joking, that's a joke. It's okay to laugh every once in a while. Judges uh, 21. Verse 25. And this is the last of verse of the book of Judges. So if you're trying to skim through the paragraphs, finding the right verse, just go to the last verse of the book. It's fine. Um, if you reach Ruth, just, you know, hey, turn to the exact previous book, and you're fine. Um, and it says this, and it says this actually a couple times in the book of Judges. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. How many Christians nowadays, how often times do we say these kinds of things? We're free from the law, right? So we're under grace, so I don't have to follow what the Bible says because I'm free to live my life. What? <laughs> well, hold on, hold on. You don't have to offer sacrifices. You don't have to, uh, you know, have a priest intercede for you. You don't have to go to a tabernacle to worship. But you do still have to live under God's ways. I mean, you can't just live as lawless. In fact, Paul says that very same thing. He says, don't let this be an excuse for, to, for you to live as lawless. Well, I thought we weren't under the law. Well, yeah, we're not under the law, but there is still a standard of right and wrong. Amen. Satanism says, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Christianity does not say that. Okay, We, we do not teach that. Absolutely not. Um, and Judges 21, 25 picks up on that. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. They made their own standard. Oh, well, we've evolved since then. We're smarter than they were. We can figure things out now. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. How do you know if you should do something? Well, it, I keep going over with God, and I say, God, if you would have just given us something to, to read or memorize or just something that would have answered our questions and given us the direction for life. And uh, But, you know, God, I guess, doesn't love us that much. You know, oh, but he does love us that much. That's why he gave us this. It was the point of having the Bible. If you don't read the Bible, I mean, come on. Did you know that in most households, people own an average of four Bibles, but over 80% of Christians do not read their Bible on a regular basis. Now, what regular basis means is one to two times a week. A week. Okay. That means the majority of Christians do not read their Bibles, even though on average, American households have four per household, on average. That's kind of a scary statistic, right? <laughs> and well, I'll give you a worse statistic. Out of the next generation that's coming up between 18 and 25, the grand majority of them do not even think that the Bible is worth owning. I think it's a three-fourths, I think. I, I forgot exact, the exact statistic on that one. But the majority of our next generation that's coming up doesn't see the importance of the Bible. Possibly because we're not actually even reading our Bibles. I don't know. Just throwing it out there. You know? But if you have something and you treat it like it's not important, chances are your kids won't think that it's important. You know? Oh, well, we go to church occasionally. Well, I mean, then it's not that important. If it's not, a, if it's not something that you make a way for, it's not important, right? Do you pay your ta your taxes when you when you when you buy food from the store? They charge you taxes regardless, right? When it comes time at the at the beginning of the year, you pay into the IRS as well, right? You do that every year. It's it's good to obey the law, right? So then, it's less good to seek God. 
So, I mean, our kids have a very interesting way of picking up every negative fault we have. And everything you do, they're going to only pay attention to mostly the bad stuff. They might pay attention to 5% of the good stuff, maybe if you're lucky. But chances are they're going to remember everything wrong you did. And one of those wrong things is probably going to be, if you're a typical American, that you said that you were a Christian and you didn't really live by it. You know? And so our kids will pick up on that and they'll say, hey, this wasn't important. You know? But of course it's not all the parents' fault. You know, anybody who says that it is one person's fault is just wrong. I mean, our kids make our own decisions. Okay? If your kids made bad decisions, guess what? That's not, that's not your fault. You do what God told you to do, and then your kids have to make their decisions. Okay? Your kids' bad decisions doesn't make you a bad parent. Okay? They do not, it does not make you a bad parent. And just because they messed up doesn't mean that you're a terrible person. Okay? Oftentimes, especially in past generations, a lot of Christians have become real focused on tearing, tearing parents down because they didn't do a good enough job. Well, that's just not what the Bible says. So, um, in conclusion, be careful what you teach, believe, say, or do. Be careful what you believe. And get rid of deception by learning God's ways. Learn God's ways. Okay? How do you learn His ways? By reading His Word, by prayer, by fellowship with the saints, spending time together. These are the kinds of things that get your mindset on the things that are eternal, not the things that pass away. Isn't your life more than, more than clothes, more than food? Why should your entire waking hours be spent thinking about these things? Why should you spend so much time worrying about you know, where you're going to work and what you're going to spend your money on? And, I mean, if you, if you look at your life as a whole, it's, it's a destructive circle that goes over and over again. We get money, we find something to waste it on, we waste it. We get money, we find some other ways to we waste it. It's this never ending process and thinking that somehow along the way it's gonna bring happiness or something. But here's the thing the more we get, the less happy we are, so we have to get more stuff to convince us that we're happy because the things that we have have made it unhappy. And so we can do this repeating circles throughout the progress of our lives. Somewhere along there we'll get happy. Somewhere, I'm sure. Which means that for those third world countries where kids are playing with dirt instead of with toys, I guess they're just doomed to never be happy. Because happiness isn't out there somewhere. It's not something we seek after. It's a byproduct of knowing God. It's a byproduct of seeking Him and spending time in His presence. The problem is, we don't stick with it for long enough because our culture has taught us that if it doesn't have an immediate payoff, it's not worth pursuing. But Christianity just says the exact opposite. We are enduring. We are persevering. And by this perseverance, it will grow us into a character like God. Okay? And I don't mean to say that we'll be like God's, but you know what I mean. Anyways, so if you'll join me in prayer, we're going to pray for two things, that God would teach us his ways, and second off, that God would put a guard over our hearts, if you'll join me, please. Lord, I pray that you would teach us your ways. Help us to know your ways. Help us to make godly decisions. Help us to include you and consult you as we live our lives, Lord. Help us to see that our life is not our own, but we've been bought with a price. Our life is yours, Lord. We are slaves to your will. We do not have the right to put ourselves first over others and over you. Your word says, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Lord, help us to learn to truly love ourselves, to truly forgive ourselves for the past. Help us to learn to love others in that same way. And help us to, to learn to love you to the fullest extent, Lord. And help us to learn your ways about freedom, Learn your ways about justice, and learn your ways about grace and love. Lord, help us to love those very ways that you teach us, Lord. For your word says that if we know what the right thing is to do, but we don't do it, that that is wrong. Help us to not only learn your ways, Lord, but to love them and to follow them. And we pray that you put a guard over our heart, Lord. Help us not to be so easily deceived. Help us to weigh our hearts and see if there's any impure ways within us, Lord, like it would be uh, on a scale false gold, that it would tip off, Lord, that it would be revealed to us, that you would, you would show us what is in our heart, or that you would guide us to repentance, you would, you would do a work in us, Lord, that you would change our hearts, Lord, help us to grow, like, grow, grow um, like you, grow uh, in character, Lord, grow in, in, in righteousness, Lord, that we would grow towards you, rather than comparing ourselves to ourselves. 
that we wouldn't be judgmental people, that we wouldn't that we wouldn't just sit around judging our brothers, or that we wouldn't judge someone, oh, I don't think they should give a word, I don't think that they are good enough, I don't think that, you know, let, help us not to be judge, judging people, Lord. Um, and uh, Lord, help us to always put you first in all of our ways. We love you. Amen. So I want to remind